Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community, understanding, expertise, results, Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnerships with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu. Smithville, fiber internet, security solutions, and voice in southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Bunger and Robertson Attorneys at Law, utilizing 75 years of experience, knowledge, and resources to help individuals and families recover in personal injury matters. Information at lawbr.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Sunday marks the 10th anniversary of same-sex marriage being legal in Indiana, but while the law has changed, perceptions of some haven't. I'm not going to change my family members or my friends' paradigm on, on that, that, but that doesn't mean that we can't be friends, right? There are currently around 11,000 same-sex couples married in Indiana. Indiana is striving to make it easier for people with disabilities to access state parks. And if we purposefully exclude a group of people, we're not only excluding them, but we're excluding their families and their friends and, and everybody else. The state DNR is seeking guidance from Hoosiers to see what natural spaces in Indiana need more accessibility. And we begin a series of interviews with candidates in next month's general election with the state's District 62 race. We'll have these stories plus the latest news from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Almost 10 years ago, on October 6, 2014, same-sex marriage became legal in Indiana after the U.S. Supreme Court allowed a lower court supportive ruling to stand. Benta Boutier reports on how opinions on the issue have and have not changed. In 2014, lobbyist Michael O'Brien sought against a constitutional amendment that aimed to ban same-sex marriage in Indiana. He's a Republican. I very much felt an obligation to like try to steer the party in the direction I thought it should go. Um, and in this case, it was, you know, to celebrate gay marriage and, and make sure the message that the party was sending that we were, you know, we were open and welcome and Oh my God, what a 10 years it's been <laughs> in not going that direction. He says opponents of same-sex marriage in Indiana's state house reacted to stop the cultural shift. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act in 2015 was just one example. In 2016, we tried to amend the civil rights statute to protect LGBTQ Hoosiers from being fired from their job for being gay or to be evicted from their housing which failed. <laughs> we, we, never, we still, to this day, have not passed that. Despite continuing political battles for LGBTQ rights, many couples are thriving. In the last decade, Kevin Howell and Andrew Roberts got married, moved back to Indiana and settled in Fort Wayne, built and sold a business together, and adopted two daughters. Howell served in the U.S. Marine Corps for more than a decade. He says he leans right of center politically. Roberts is running for their county coroner in November as a Democrat. Howell says that 10 years ago, he was not as concerned as he is now about full legal recognition of gay marriage. All of these things that I didn't think about, um, the, the legal aspects of it, the, the tax aspect, parental rights, stuff like that, um, they're obviously so important. Um, uh, that, that just wasn't something that I ever thought about. In, 17 years prior to that. Nationally, acceptance of same-sex marriage dipped slightly last summer, a Gallup poll revealed, but it is still markedly higher than 10 years ago. In 2014, 55% of people said they believe same-sex marriage should be recognized by the law with the same rights as heterosexual marriages. This year, it was... This year, that was up to 69%. Hell doesn't expect everyone to support his marriage. He has friends and family who don't believe in same-sex marriage, but they still spend holidays and weekends together. I coexist with my friends and family that may not agree with me because I respect, 
when someone has a, I'll use the word paradigm again, of, of gay marriage, right? Don't try to change that person's mind. Just treat each other good. That's all you got to do. You know what I mean? You're not going to change someone's paradigm, okay? I'm not going to change my family members or my friends' paradigm on, on that. that. But that doesn't mean that we can't be friends, right? That's just how I view things. I don't take it personally, and as long as they're not trying to change my paradigm, right? According to the 2020 U.S. Census, Indiana had almost 11,000 married same-sex couples then. Statistics from UCLA in 2019 showed that Indiana Adjusted for Population had the 32nd most gay marriages in the country. Micah Beckwith, the Republican nominee for Indiana Lieutenant Governor, believes all people should have the right to have their partnership legally recognized, but he wants civil unions, not marriages, for same-sex couples. Beckwith also supports adoption for LGBTQ couples, but he described married heterosexual couples with children as the gold standard. We've been lowering the standards of what God said is right, true, and virtuous. We've got to get back to that. And uh, again, there's, it doesn't mean that you're not welcome. It doesn't mean that you don't have a place in society if you have different, differing opinions, but don't lower the gold standard because as you do, society will begin to break down as we're, as we're seeing. O'Brien said people on his side of the issue need to remain vigilant. You know, fighting, fighting the right fight is important so you don't, you don't slide backwards. A recent poll from Target Point Consulting says 63% of Hoosiers believe same-sex marriage should be protected. Since 2014, about 2-3% to of Indiana's marriages have been same-sex couples. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ben Tabutier. Republican Mike Braun and Democrat Jennifer McCormick drew sharp contrast with each other in the first televised debate in this fall's gubernatorial race. On the debate hosted by Fox 59, CBS 4 in Indianapolis Wednesday night, both candidates spoke about the policy proposals they've released in recent weeks, from property taxes to utility cost, teacher pay to affordable housing. But on so many of the issues, the bottom line came down to this. They say it's the other party that's to blame for any problems. When I travel the state, they're worried about the economy. The federal government has been run by her party over the last four years, and we've got some of the worst economic results we've had ever. Indiana that we're talking about today that is 47th in the nation in quality of life, 41st in the nation in educational attainment. You know, we can go on and on and some of the statistics that are alarming have been under 20 years of one party rule under Republicans. Libertarian Donald Rainwater was excluded from the first debate. He joined Braun and McCormick for a second debate last night. A third debate is scheduled for October 24th. Braun says he's replacing a doctored image in an attack ad against McCormick, which ran afoul of the state's new law governing digital manipulation of campaign materials. The Braun ad altered a photo of a McCormick campaign rally to falsify the signs McCormick supporters were holding as they stood behind the Democrat. Experts say it can be hard to identify altered images and videos without a disclaimer. If something seems implausible or if it seems like it's getting, you know, an extreme emotional reaction from you, it's always good to take a breath and stop and think. The McCormick campaign called the original ad dishonest and accused Braun of being desperate to distract voters. Well, joined now by Clayton Baumgarth for the latest headlines from around the area. Hi, Clayton. Hey, Joe. Convention center leaders continue taking feedback and refining the expansion design, this time with local government officials. The very next phase is design development, and it is for just exactly what it sounds like it's for. It's to continue to develop and iterate the design. So there's a long way to go, but, uh, but we have come a long way. The refined design includes more limestone and public art, improved pedestrian scale entry, and a simplified roof line. A shift in the footprint of the exhibit hall allows for a second floor roof garden, accessible outdoor green space with a view of downtown. However, no new parking lots are planned in the expansion. As the surface lots begin to get filled, I think we're going to have to continue conversations about where are we putting cars and how do we get people to the convention center. 
The bond proposal to pay for the estimated $52 million project should come before City Council during the first quarter of next year. Beacon is over halfway to its funding goal of $20 million for a new facility on the west side. The service and shelter provider for people experiencing homelessness in Bloomington is currently on South Walnut Street. Tuesday kicked off the public portion of fundraising. The goal is to raise $2.3 million from individuals, businesses, and faith communities by spring. I'm not sure if I knew where we were going to end up, um, if we would have thought it was possible for us to take this on, but, um, but uh, we, we are doing it. We're getting it done. Yes, we will and, uh, and, can, and can. The new facility will provide overnight shelter and services on its first floor. The second floor will have 30 apartments, five of which will be designated for people with participating in a work exchange with Beacon. The City of Bloomington has contributed $600,000 to the new facility, and the Monroe County Commissioners have contributed $500,000. A new ordinance requiring all Bloomington businesses and public places to activate closed captioning on televisions will start January 1st. It's something the Indiana Association of the Deaf had been trying to pass at the state level. The legislature is not uh, uh, particularly warming to the idea and we're just not going anywhere with it. So we've decided we want to do it at the local level and lo and behold, Bloomington is the ideal city to start with. Sherman says the ordinance will be complaint driven, meaning someone would have to make complaints to the Human, right, Human, Human Rights Commission to enforce the measure. There are no fines for failing to comply, and many cases will be handled with a simple conversation with management. Candlelight vigils continue on Indiana University's campus against ex its expressive activity policy, which limits where and when protests can take place. Organizers say the vigils, which have taken place every Sunday night for the past five weeks, intentionally violate IU's curfew for demonstrations. About 20 people have been cited so far. Alumnus and Vietnam War activist Guy Lofman says the university threatened him with a citation or a trespassing charge. I think they're very hesitant to take action against me because they can't bully me. Lofman isn't a faculty, student, or staff member, and he says IU may not take action against him. He plans to continue attending the vigils. Solar and wind farms occupied 424,000 acres, or less than 0.05% of rural land in 2020, according to a recent study by the USDA. The study also noted the majority of agricultural land near solar and wind farms remains in farming despite the expansion of renewable energy projects. For example, 15% of solar sites that had been in agriculture before installation were not being used for agriculture afterward. For wind turbines, the share that left agriculture was less than 1%. Overall, the study suggests that renewable energy development can coexist with agricultural production in many cases. COVID isn't going away, but how are the newer variants different from previous variants? The biggest difference comes down to how the virus interacts with the cells in the human body. The virus travels along the surface of a cell until its proteins can bind with receptors. So it's pretty interesting that as it mutates, the binding sites change, and as those binding sites change, the, uh, the symptoms change. The most recent variant family, Omicron, causes more sore throats, runny noses, and itchy eyes. Steinecker says the latest vaccine should be seen as more of an update since it targets more recent variants of the Omicron family. A Northwest Indiana orchard is cheering on the WNBA Rookie of the Year with a markedly Midwestern display, a five-acre corn maze. County Line Orchard in Hobart unveiled the agricultural artwork of Indiana Fever star Caitlin Clark in early September. The Orchard's Chief Operating Officer Dana Morris said the maze design was a slam dunk idea. The maze will be open until October 31st. And finally, Indiana University is celebrating Hoosier mu musician John Mellencamp with a permanent addition to campus. The University will unveil a statue of the songwriter on October 18th in the Fine Arts Plaza next to the IU Auditorium. Mellencamp lives in Bloomington, has an honorary degree from IU, and has been a benefactor of the University for decades. Currently, his paintings are featured in the Eskenazi Museum of Art. Last year, he donated archives of his work and life to IU. So, Clint, no pink house is just a new sculpture. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. The Indiana DNR is working to make land and state parks and recreation areas more accessible. And we begin our look at key races in next month's election with Thomas Horrocks, who's running for the District 62 seat. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. From the beginning then. 
I saw the ghost. You have any proof of that? Something terrifying has happened. Very promising. So what have you got for us? We have a bit of a mystery. I have to finish this. So what have you ladies been up to today? You can't have the United States without the histories of all of the Latino communities. Connection to culture is so important. I move and feel in my traditions and my stories. We do what we love, we respect our loyalty. We have changed U.S. history. Si, se puede. <laughs> Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. The District 62 election for state representative was among the most competitive in the state two years ago. Dave Hall, a Republican, won by a mere 74 votes out of more than 26,000 votes. Benta Boutier reports on this year's race. Democrat Thomas Horrocks, a pastor at Beechwood Church in French Lick, is a former military chaplain and political newcomer. So. Uh, having done the work of a pastor and chaplain for the last decade or so, it became increasingly clear to me that charity will never fix what policy creates. Horrocks isn't suggesting an end to charity. He's explaining why he's running for a seat in the state legislature. He says he's particularly concerned about issues such as food insecurity, mental health, and health care expenses. So for the last few years, I've been paying more and more attention to politics, state-level politics, um, paying attention uh, specifically to state legislatures, which I think have a lot of influence uh, over people's lives, which I didn't realize before. A lot of the policies that come from the state house, um, education, uh, workers' protections, the, the state can do a lot or not do a lot to um, affect the lives of its citizens. Despite having no political experience, Horrocks believes he can be an effective representative for the district, which includes all of Brown County and parts of Monroe and Jackson counties. He says issues such as lack of maternal care in some counties is the result of years of Republican leadership. These are the problems that are the result of a supermajority that continually prioritizes the wrong things uh, and they're hurting everyday Hoosiers. And, and um, Dave Hall is a part of that, right? He, he often votes right alongside with the supermajority, um, and even when he doesn't, there's not enough accountability there. Horrocks is acutely aware that Hall won election to his first term in 2022 with only 50.1% of the vote. He says he's communicating that to voters. This particular district is not one that's so gerrymandered that, um, that you know, their, their vote matters all the time, anytime, but in this particular race, every vote uh, is crucial. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ben Tabutier. WTIU made several attempts to reach out to incumbent Republican Dave Hall, but did not receive a response. The entire interview with Horrocks is available on our website. The state of Indiana is trying to make it easier for people with disabilities to enjoy the outdoors. Indiana Public Broadcasting's Rebecca Thiel reports experts say things like accessible parks and trails benefit many more people than just those who have disabilities, and that includes the state itself. This is why I brought you this way. This is the fun part. Indianapolis resident Nancy Griffin says she enjoys the challenge of maneuvering around tree roots here at Eagle Creek Park. She's using a motorized wheelchair, affectionately known as Peggy. Which is short for Pegasus, the winged horse, which is the mythical animal. But Pegasus can fly, and I feel like when I'm on Peggy, I can fly. With Peggy's help, Griffin can get to places she might not have been able to before. She walked on the beach for the first time a couple of years ago while she was in Florida for her granddaughter's wedding. I'm off running up and down the beach in the sand out here acting like an idiot, but just having the best time because I could go right up to the surf and, and come right back up. It's where the, all the umbrellas are sitting and the people are, you know, enjoying their little beverages and chatting away. And it just was the most fun. I felt like I was five years old. Though Griffin has her own chair for trails, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources loans out motorized chairs at 11 state parks. Here at the McCormick's Creek State Park Nature Center, an employee shows how caregivers often bring the chair to visitors with disabilities. 
This year, the DNR released a web page where people with disabilities can find things like trail chairs, as well as accessible places to hike, fish, hunt, or get in the water. Edwards says at first, he didn't want to have an accessibility web page. He didn't want people with disabilities to feel limited to only going to certain trails and parks. Then I realized that we had not done, I had not done a good job of promoting a lot of the things that are out there that we've been working on for years. For example, um, the trail chairs. We've had trail chairs since 2006. The number of adults in the U.S. that have some type of disability has been slowly increasing over time. Edward says people with disabilities are living longer, and they want to be able to enjoy nature the way everyone else does. People with disabilities are coming back from Iraq and Iran, um, military situations where, you know, they, they want to go out and uh, experience the same things they experienced before. Edward says getting rid of barriers for people with disabilities benefits other folks too, particularly children. Having lower railings and wildlife viewing areas can ensure someone sitting or a child standing can both see the sand hill cranes. Ramps accommodate wheelchairs and strollers. This beach mat at Payne Town State Recreation Area in Bloomington makes it so wheelchairs can roll down to the lake or kids can keep their feet cool and off the hot sand. Edward says better access is first and foremost the right thing to do, but it's also financially smart. We're trying to reach out to all people. And if we purposefully exclude a group of people, we're not only excluding them, but we're excluding their families and their friends and, and everybody else. So um, I would say that's certainly a, on our minds that, that this is income generating, but it's not the priority. Though the DNR has done a lot to make its properties physically accessible, Edward says there's still more to do. He says he'd like to see more tactile exhibits, like the one at Falls of the Ohio State Park, which allows someone who's blind or has limited vision to feel models of the fossils under the water. Nancy Griffin says she'd like to see more Braille and more accommodations for people who are sensitive to bright lights or loud noises. I'd love to see um, a, a trail walk or a, a bird hike here at the park with someone who's an interpreter giving the, the talk so that people who are deaf can go and it. You don't have to hear the birds. If you can see them, you can still enjoy them. Edward says feedback from the public is the main way the DNR prioritizes properties for accessible upgrades. Even hearing from one person can sometimes turn into action. The DNR has put out a survey to find out which natural spaces in Indiana need more accessibility. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Rebecca Thiel. You can find a link to the survey on our website. The Indiana Department of Natural Resources released 25 endangered ground squirrels at Kankakee Sands Nature Preserve. Rebecca Thiel reports partners in the project hope to eventually reestablish the squirrel in its original northwest Indiana habitat. The Franklin's ground squirrel looks like a chubbier tree squirrel without the fluffy tail. It lives underground and hibernates about half the year. And unlike prairie dogs, they're not very social, keeping burrows to themselves and their pups. State mammologist for the DNR, Brad Westrich, says farming and development destroyed a lot of the squirrel's prairie habitat and fragmented the populations that are still around. Being isolated from one another for so long eventually took hold and caused small populations to sort of wink out of existence. And, and what you have happening there is uh, essentially a loss of genetic diversity where they're not able to cope with changes. Partners in the project say if some of the ground squirrels survive hibernation, have babies, and don't leave the preserve, they'll consider the release a success. Right now, Hoosiers can't go outside and wander around natural areas and hear these little chubsters squeak and run across the trail. And I'm super excited to be part of the, the project that's going to help future generations and kids in, in the future just see these guys. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Rebecca Thiel. If the relocation is a, is a success, the DNR will look for other Indiana pra uh, prairies where the squirrels can be introduced. Well, before the season started, the Indiana football team was picked to finish 17th in the 18-team Big Ten. So the Hoosiers currently being 5-0, ranked number 23 in the country, might surprise a lot of people, but not first-year head coach Kurt Signetti. I pretty much told everybody when I got hired that this is what was possible, and I felt uh, strongly about that after the we brought the 22 transfers in in December and added a few more at the end of spring ball. 
saw, and saw the culture come together the way it did, and, but we had to put it on the field. One of those transfers playing a big role for IU is quarterback Curtis Rourke. The fifth-year senior from Ohio has thrown for almost 1,400 yards and 11 touchdowns in the first five games. He shook off his, two, his first two interceptions of the season last week against Maryland to lead Indiana to a 42-28 to win. He doesn't really seem to get phased by a whole lot of stuff, and uh, he's on to the next play. Now the Hoosiers are looking to go 3-0 in the Big Ten this weekend when they travel to Evanston, Illinois to face Northwestern. Kickoff is at 3.30 on the Big Ten Network. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community, understanding, expertise, results, Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com, IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnerships with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu, Smithville Fiber Internet Security Solutions and Voice in Southern Indiana, more information at smithville.com. Bunger and Robertson Attorneys at Law, utilizing 75 years of experience, knowledge, and resources to help individuals and families recover in personal injury matters. Information at lawbr.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.